Welcome back. This is John Holzberger with part two of the 2021 ITE review series lectures on peripheral nerve blocks. We'll be moving through the lower extremities and again covering some of the highlights and topics that will be important to know for your in-training exam. Yesterday we had looked at the motor and sensory innervation of the upper extremities and the brachial plexus and now today we look at the rest of the picture, the lower extremities and the lumbosacral plexus. These nerve roots arising from L1 to S4 are providing the motor and sensory innervation of the lower extremities. The lumbar plexus arises from the L1 through 4 lumbar nerve roots and is responsible for much of the motor and sensory innervation to the thigh as well as going down to the uh, medial leg and ankle. This also includes most of the knee. The major branches coming off the lumbar plexus are the iliohypogastric ilioinguinal, genitofemoral, lateral femoral cutaneous, femoral, and obturator. Continuing down, we have the sacral plexus, which arises from L4 down to S4 and is responsible for motor and sensory innervation of the posterior thigh as well as most of the lower leg and the foot except for the medial aspect which is innervated by the saphenous nerve the terminal branch of the femoral nerve so coming off of the sacral plexus your major branches are your sciatic which goes on to um, give rise to the common perineal and the tibial nerves. Um, the common perineal is also referred to as the fibular nerve in some texts and illustrations, so don't let that be a point of confusion for you. The sacral plexus also gives rise to the superior and inferior gluteal nerves, which are a little bit less relevant for our purposes. The posterior femoral cutaneous nerve, which is relevant for our purposes because that supplies the cutaneous sensory innervation of most of the posterior thigh. And then the pudendal nerve. This illustration gives a, a nice summary of the innervation of the lower extremities. And part of what I think makes this challenging to get a handle on is there's a tremendous amount of variability, um, not only in the distribution of the innervation from person to person and from textbook to textbook, but there is also a surprising amount of variability in the nomenclature. Um, and so I think oftentimes one of the best ways to learn these things is to uh, start with one source. If you're bouncing back and forth, you'll see different names for different nerves and slightly different distributions, and that will just add to the confusion. And so um, I'm going to try to kind of simplify this for you. So I just want to preface this slide by saying that this is an oversimplification. But I think that's important because as you are learning this in particular, I think a lot of times people end up drowning in the details, like I had mentioned before, because not only from one patient to the next is there a little bit of variability in sensory distribution from these nerves, but one textbook to the next, you see different nerves uh, or different distributions for these nerves and even slightly different names. I've tried to kind of distill it down uh, here into something that should be easier to help remember. And this is kind of fundamental to providing good patient care, because if you can remember these territories, it's gonna help you make good decisions about what blocks are appropriate or necessary for different types of procedures, for um, uh, you know different cases that you're gonna encounter. I've kind of grouped it into um, four major nerve uh, groupings. 
and this includes the nerve and, and all of their terminal branches. So for, in green here, you see the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve territory, which is the lateral thigh. That's a pretty easy one to remember. It does also cover a little bit of the right knee. In yellow, you see the femoral coverage, the anterior and medial thigh, and that extends all the way down via the saphenous to the medial lower extremity, all the way down to the ankle. In red, you see the sciatic coverage, and that's going to be the a small portion of the lateral knee, and then basically the rest of the lower extremity below that, except for the part that we already talked about that's covered by the femoral. And then lastly, in orange, on the back of the thigh, you see the innervation of the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve. That's a little bit of a harder one to remember. Some other textbooks will call it the posterior posterior cutaneous nerve of the thigh. Um, and, and don't let its name as the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve confuse you. It's not anything to do with the femoral nerve. It's arising um, independently off of the lumbosacral plexus. Now, um, before we go on into some more detail on blocking all of these nerves, I do just want to touch a little bit more on the posterior femoral cutaneous um, because that's a little bit of an outlier. Liar. Now, it does run uh, with the sciatic nerve uh, higher in the pelvis, and so it's possible if you do a very proximal sciatic block, a posterior transgluteal approach, for example, um, you may block the posterior femoral cutaneous with that and get, um, you know, basically coverage of the orange and red levels together. That's not common, and um, we don't tend to do very high sciatic blocks that commonly. Um, and I think in the big picture, that's okay. And, and the reason for that is most of the surgeries that we are routinely doing on the legs don't involve the posterior aspect of the thigh. Um, some studies have shown that uh, patients will generally tolerate a tourniquet um, just fine, even if that is not blocked. Um, but that's a little bit controversial. If you find yourself in a situation where um, you need uh, that posterior thigh territory um, blocked, then, you know, for example, there's uh, a burn patient who's having a skin graft taken from that area or something. Um, it's it's a block that can be done um, sort of cutaneously or subcutaneously, I should say. Um, it's a little bit beyond the scope of what we're doing with this lecture, but basically you can place a large 10 to 15 milliliter skin wheel um, kind of at the inferior uh, gluteal crease um, and can catch that uh, PFC nerve as it's emerging and, and get some amount of analgesia of that posterior thigh. Um, so, but as we move through the rest of the blocks, you'll see that's kind of the one area that gets left out or tends to be kind of ignored or forgotten about. And the bottom line is it just isn't as clinically relevant uh, as everything else. So with that, let's start taking a look at some of the most common lower extremity blocks. So the first block I would like to cover is the fascia iliaca block. And this is one that has really gained traction uh, in the last couple of years, particularly at our institution for uh, orthopedic injuries to the femur, to the hip, because it really does provide great analgesia to that area. Um, and by adding in the lateral femoral cutaneous, you get a little bit additional coverage um, than you would just with a straight femoral. And we typically try to do this as high as we can uh, in the uh, 
in the groin. And, and so, you know, with a hip injury, the higher, typically the better you're going to, uh, you're going to see, you know, better analgesia because you're catching those nerves, um, more proximal in their course. Um, this block can also be helpful for lateral knee surgery as well, um, where you may be concerned that by just doing a straight femoral, you would miss that lateral femoral cutaneous uh, coverage of the knee. I'm not going to go through it here, um, but I just want you to be aware you'll hear the two pop technique. And that was kind of a more historical landmark based approach. There are plenty of people who still do it that way, um, but I think uh, particularly with our younger anesthesiologists, um, you know, who are very savvy with ultrasound, it's it's really more or less exclusively done with ultrasound guidance at this point. And, and I think that definitely introduces a, an extra layer of safety and also improves your success. And so um, I just wanted you to be aware that you'll hear that at points. And really what that is based off of is um, after you had marked out your anatomical landmarks and introduced your needle, you would feel a pop or a give as you pass through the fascia lata, and then a second pop as you went through fascia iliaca, and at that point you would deposit your local anesthetic. Um, you know, as I mentioned, you get the femoral coverage covering uh, anterior medial thigh, uh, and then the LFC coverage as well. Uh, occasionally you'll get some obturator coverage, um, but that's less reliable. Um, there are many different approaches to do this block, even with ultrasound guidance. And, you know, some are super inguinal, others are infra-inguinal. Um, I personally think that as you are starting off learning these things, it's really important to do something that's reproducible, that's relatively straightforward, so you can get comfortable with it. Um, and so I set it up similar to a femoral nerve block where you look for your neurovascular bundle um, and then you look immediately lateral to that where you will see the iliacus muscle and right on top of that muscle belly is the fascia iliaca and that is where you're going to deposit your local anesthetic You'll, you're going to try to kind of peel that muscle belly off the fascial plane um, it'll track down into the uh, uh, femoral nerve and track over to the LFC, kind of getting both in one shot. I would definitely encourage you to learn some of the other approaches and other techniques, particularly the supra inguinal techniques, once you get a little bit more comfortable with the block. But I think uh, approaching it similar to how you do a femoral is, is a really great starting point and can um, offer uh, excellent analgesia, even for our hip patient. Uh, hip fracture patients. We often don't use nerve stimulation just because we are targeting spread uh, inside a fascial plane, um, you know, but that's something that you can always consider to try to improve safety and localization. Um, this is a nice image from Nysora that kind of reviews the ultrasound anatomy. You can see your femor femoral uh, artery on the right side there. Uh, femoral nerve as you're moving lateral, and then the iliacus muscle um, with the fascia iliaca directly above it, and the blue is representing uh, where your local anesthetic should spread. The, the white arrows are indicating the fascia iliaca. Um, just of note, you know, kind of like I had mentioned earlier in this presentation, sometimes the naming, the nomenclature can just be so challenging because everywhere you look at something different. So just remember that iliopsoas is uh, comprised of the iliacus and the psoas muscles, uh, kind of where they course together. And so, you know, that's why some books will, or some sites, whatever, will say, you know, iliopsoas. I always remember iliacus uh, just because um, you're doing an iliac block. It, it just intuitively makes more sense that way. With the femoral nerve block, um, this is going to be a, a fairly similar setup. Um, and, and this is really obviously one of the bread and butter blocks uh, that you should get really good at doing. Um, the main things to remember is this is going to be block of choice for uh, anterior medial thigh and anterior knee. It also gives you good coverage of the femur. Um, and so uh, 
you know, and then all the way down to the, the medial aspect uh, of the ankle. Um, when you combine this with a sciatic block, you will get near total lower extremity analgesia. Um, but it typically will still miss obturator and lateral femoral cutaneous. Um, so, you know, if you need that coverage, you can either go a little bit higher, do the fascia iliaca block, um, or you can add on an obturator, which is a little bit beyond the scope of this particular lecture. Um, remember, as you kind of cross the knee, the femoral nerve gives rise to the saphenous nerve, um, which is a sensory nerve innervating that lower medial aspect of the distal lower extremity. When you're doing your imaging, and I'll show this on the next page, there's, or next slide, there's a lot of ways to try to remember this, but again, you need something that's simple and easy and that's never gonna leave your mind. Uh, when maybe you go a little while without doing one of these and you need it to come back right away. So, um, you know, there's navel and a few others, but I always remember the van drives away. Uh, to help remember the relationship of the vein, the artery, and the nerve in the, um, in the upper uh, thigh. Um, because it works on both sides. It doesn't matter which way you're, you're facing or which side of the patient you're on. Um, just always imagine van driving away, vein, artery, nerve from medial to lateral. And that will always uh, help you remember that relationship. For nerve stim if you if you're stimming on a femoral block you're going to be looking for patellar uh, or quad snap uh, here is a nice nysora image of kind of the general setup for ultrasound imaging here you can see your femoral artery the vein is uh, just off screen kind of medial to that um, and then laterally you see the femoral nerve just below fascia iliaca um, and your needle trajectory is shown uh, with the local anesthetic spread uh, in blue. And often we're trying to get kind of a circumferential spread um, in that region. The primary thing is to make sure that you're below the fascial planes um, and uh, checking for you know, uh, high pressure with injection, um, uh, you know, aspirating. And, and again, with nerve stem, you'd be looking for patellar or quad uh, snap. Uh, so then next we will just uh, talk about adductor canal block, um, also called the saphenous nerve block. This is really basically just a more distal femoral block. Um, and the main reason that we will often do these is uh, because in most patients, this will result in um, good analgesia of the anterior knee and lower medial uh, aspect of the uh, distal leg with less motor block. And so, uh, you know, it, it may be a better option for them to have a lower fall risk, to be able to potentially ambulate sooner after surgery um, and get around a little bit easier. And so, you know, certainly you can make a strong argument that um, if you don't need that additional coverage higher up, uh, that this is a, an excellent option. Uh, remember, the saphenous is the terminal sensory branch coming from the femoral. Um, and it's the only nerve below the knee uh, that's not from the sciatic. Um, so the naming uh, comes from, you know, it's the saphenous nerve and we're blocking it in the adductor canal. Um, and so uh, that's where that nomenclature um, comes from. Um, the the um, ultrasound setup it looks somewhat similar to a femoral block. It's just usually done kind of at the mid thigh. Um, I will show that in the next slide here. Um, one thing to keep in mind is if they're going to be using a tourniquet for the procedure and you're worried about tourniquet pain, that ephemeral is going to be a better option. Um, and also to always consider, you know, if you're placing a catheter is the location of that catheter going to be in the way either of a tourniquet or of the procedure, uh, procedure itself. It really does no good when you place a catheter and then in the OR the surgeon removes it because it's, it's in their way. And so um, while this can be a great option, uh, you just have to make sure that those things check out before, uh, before placing a catheter for this.
this is a really nice image from Nysora, um, you know, from kind of mid thigh showing the ultrasound imaging that you're going to get to do this block. Um, really, the easiest way to think about this is you're going to trace the femoral artery kind of further down to mid thigh. Uh, now, the nerve will remain lateral um, and within the fascial planes. Um, between the sartorius and the vastus medialis. And so when I'm doing this block, um, it can be a little hard to actually visualize the nerve at this level. And so I'm trying to um, open up that fascial plane uh, immediately uh, lateral to the femoral artery, just as is so nicely documented here uh, with your local anesthetic kind of spreading in that blue distribution. So um, as you recall, the sciatic nerve supplies sensory motor innervation to the distal lower extremity, extremity uh, below the knee, um, as we've touched on multiple times, except for that medial portion, uh, which is from the saphenous. Most commonly, you will be doing popliteal sciatic blocks, um, which is named for doing it in the popliteal fossa, but typically we'll be performing these a little bit higher um, uh, kind of in the mid to distal thigh, uh, most commonly with a lateral approach. Um, it's important to remember the sciatic nerve gives rise to the common perineal, um, also known as the fibular, as well as the tibial nerves. Um, these nerves will separate typically mid thigh, um, and that's where we are often trying to place our block, is either at or slightly above the separation. But it's important to remember that in you know, as many as 12% of patients, that separation can actually occur as high up as the pelvis. And so uh, that's why it is important to identify that split when you're doing this block, um, because you need to make sure that you are, are catching both of those nerves, or otherwise you're going to have quite a bit of sparing um, down in the lower extremity. Uh, there are many, many approaches to blocking the sciatic nerve. It's a large nerve. Um, from all the way up in the pelvis, um, you know, down the leg. There's anterior, posterior, transgluteal, lateral, popliteal. Um, there's just a lot of different approaches. And so I think the, the real um, kind of utilitarian approach is, uh, is what you'll see us commonly do is kind of a lateral approach. We typically will elevate the leg in a boot a little bit and kind of get our ultrasound pictures uh, from posterior, find the nerve in the uh, popliteal fossa, trace it up until we see the common perineal and tibial coming together, and then block it at that location. Um, I think it is important to remember the terminal branches of the sciatic, and this becomes more important when we get into doing the ankle blocks, um, but just to just to go over it once here, um, you'll get four terminal, four major terminal branches, uh, the superficial perineal, the deep perineal, uh, posterior tibial, and the sural. And that will provide most of the innervation uh, down to the foot and ankle um, with a little bit from the uh, saphenous branch off the femoral. So, um, as you recall, the sciatic nerve supplies sensory motor innervation to the distal lower extremity, extremity uh, below the knee, um, as we've touched on multiple times, except for that medial portion, uh, which is from the saphenous. Most commonly, you will be doing popliteal sciatic blocks, um, which is named for doing it in the popliteal fossa, but typically we'll be performing these a little bit higher um, uh, kind of in the mid to distal thigh, uh, most commonly with a lateral approach. Um, it's important to remember the sciatic nerve gives rise to the common perineal, um, also known as the fibular, as well as the tibial nerves. Um, these nerves will separate typically mid thigh, um, and that's where we are often trying to place our block, is either at or slightly above the separation. But it's important to remember that in you know, as many as 12% of patients, that separation can actually occur as high up as the pelvis. And so uh, that's why it is important to identify that split when you're doing this block, um, because you need to make sure that you are, 
are catching both of those nerves, or otherwise you're going to have quite a bit of sparing um, down in the lower extremity. Uh, there are many, many approaches to blocking the sciatic nerve. It's a large nerve um, from all the way up in the pelvis, um, you know, down the leg. There's anterior, posterior, transgluteal, lateral, popliteal. Um, there's just a lot of different approaches. And so I think the, the real um, kind of utilitarian approach is, uh, is what you'll see us commonly do is kind of a lateral approach. We typically will elevate the leg in a boot a little bit and kind of get our ultrasound pictures uh, from posterior, find the nerve in the uh, popliteal fossa, trace it up until we see the common perineal and tibial coming together, and then block it at that location. Um, I think it is important to remember the terminal branches of the sciatic, and this becomes more important when we get into doing the ankle blocks, um, but just to just to go over it once here, um, you'll get four terminal, four major terminal branches, uh, the superficial perineal, the deep perineal, uh, posterior tibial, and the sural. And that will provide most of the innervation uh, down to the foot and ankle um, with a little bit from the uh, saphenous branch off the femoral. And last but not least, well, maybe least, is the ankle block. This is sort of one of those things like the brachial plexus where uh, it's just trying to um, get this to stay in your brain long term can be challenging. But we're just going to go through uh, the basics here. Um, ankle blocks are a reasonable option for short, minimal procedures on the distal foot. Um, as you can probably tell by my lack of enthusiasm, I am, am not a huge fan of ankle blocks, and I know that many um, out there will consider that blasphemy, and while well, you're doing it wrong, um, you know, the, the reality is, I'll just, I'll kind of preface, preface going through it with this, the reality is in clinical practice, even in expert hands, I'm talking, you know, people who have done pain fellowships, do pain, uh, you know, pain team all the time. Um, the failure rate with, with ankle blocks is probably somewhere between 25 to 50%. Now that is a number I'm just pulling out of thin air. And of course, my anecdotal experience should never be taken as ultimate truth or evidence-based medicine. Um, but I guess what I'm really trying to get at here is, let's say you have this patient who has, you know, severe, uh, systolic heart failure, EF less than 20%, uh, you know, a, a very sick patient who, uh, you know, needs a toe amputation. Um, it may seem on the surface like an ankle block would be a great option and, the reason I would argue against that is, as I said, the failure rate is just unacceptably high when you really need surgical level analgesia for a procedure on the foot. Um, I would suggest going with a, uh, a combined, you know, popliteal sciatic and a adductor canal femoral. Using ultrasound guidance, you're going to get with very high reliability, very dense coverage, and patients are going to tolerate the procedure well. Plus, it's just two injections. With the ankle block, you are doing usually closer to four or five separate injections, um, and so patients actually seem to tolerate it a little bit less well. Um, and it just doesn't work as reliably. But all that being said, all my personal biases aside, um, it is something that you should know about. You do need to know the distal branches and you should have a basic understanding of their layout. This is something that's easy to ask about and people love to ask about it. Um, you have those five distal branches. Remember, like we talked about, four coming from the sciatic, one from the femoral. 
Your four sciatic, sciatic branches are your superficial and deep perineal. Um, the web space between the first and second toes is just one of those like everybody loves to ask about kind of things. So remember that the deep perineal is the web space between the first and second toes. Your posterior tibial comes down and does kind of the heel and the sole of the foot. Um, the sural is taking care of the lateral foot. And then as we've covered many times, hopefully it's becoming uh, so redundant by now that you're rolling your eyes that the saphenous is covering the medial aspect of the ankle. To block the posterior tibial, um, if you see in the bottom right picture uh, B, um, you're going to be just medial to the Achilles tendon at the level of the medial malleolus. You're going to inject your local anesthetic there to try to catch posterior tibial. Then you're going to go over to the uh, lateral side of the Achilles at the same level uh, and inject there to try to catch the sural. And then the deep perineal, superficial perineal, and saphenous can all be blocked with a pretty generous sized linear skin wheel across the anterior aspect of the ankle at the same level. Um, now, so you can kind of do this, you know, people will argue is it one injection or multiple. I will tell you that with the shape of a person's ankle, it is extraordinarily difficult, if not impossible, to get an adequate skin, skin wheel with just, you know, one pass of the needle. You're going to have to come out, redirect, inject, come out, redirect, inject. And now you can go through areas that you've already numbed. And so maybe for the patient, they only experience it as, a, as kind of one stick. Um, but, you know, you, you really are doing uh, kind of a minimum of, of three separate needle sticks in order to um, perform this block. And maybe one of you listening will, will get really good at this um, and have a higher success rate and, and prove me wrong and, and use this routinely um, for procedures on the, on the foot. Uh, with that, I appreciate everyone's attention. I wish you the very best of luck uh, with this upcoming exam. Uh, please always feel free to reach out if you have any questions or uh, corrections or, you know, anything that I can do to be useful always happy to be a resource. Happy holidays.